On tomorrow's world, bridge bashing, the invention that stops high vehicles going under low bridges. These are genetically modified liver cells. Could they be a cure for diabetes? And feel the heat with the Navy's finest as they tackle the latest in fire training simulators. Hello and welcome to the future and the new alarm that warns vehicles of impending disaster. You'd think that the last thing someone driving a high vehicle would do would be to try to drive under a bridge that's too low. But it happens, on average, four times every day. A frightening statistic. And it adds up to millions of pounds worth of damage every year and the risk of appalling injury. This was only a test, but sometimes passengers get caught in real accidents. And that's exactly what happened to Graham and Ryan when they were at the front of a bus five years ago. So tell me what happened to you. Well, we, it was just like a normal day, really, right? We went out on a school trip, and we went, we came to this bridge, and from the distance, I thought, well, that, that, that looks a bit smaller. So as we were coming more towards it, I just shouted, go. And afterwards there was just a lot of blood and glass around and everybody was just screaming and shouting and i just seen Graham's like you know his scalp ripped off and it weren't nice ryan's friend graham was knocked unconscious and remembers nothing but he carries with him a constant reminder of how close to death he came bend your head down show me those scars so you got the one that goes from there to there yeah and one there there to there yeah this footage of the wrecked bus shows just how lucky they were to escape alive. I'm about six foot now, but then I was only about four, about four foot five, and the doctor said if it was a little bit bigger, I probably wouldn't be here now. Well, sadly, it is surprisingly easy for the drivers of any high vehicle to come across a bridge that's too low. It's a classic mistake for bus drivers who are used to driving a single decker and then one day take out a double decker and for lorry drivers who tow loads of varying heights and have to remember each day how high their new load is. Well, I've come to a haulage depot here in Birmingham to test out a new GPS system which should help drivers of high vehicles avoid bridges which they can't fit under. And this is it, this is the system. Inside here is a database of all bridges under 16 foot 6. And also inside here is a GPS system. So the system knows where the lorry is in relation to those bridges. Now, if the driver is driving towards a bridge which is too low for the vehicle, the system will set up a whole series of bleeps and warning lights. So will it work? We're going to test it out by driving loads of different heights under a series of low bridges. The height of this load has already been programmed into the system and taped over. Neither I nor Jimmy Hall, the driver, know what it is. We'll be relying solely on the unit's warning systems to stop us hitting bridges which are too low for our load. Ahead of us is a course of three bridges. The first has a clearance of 15 feet 9 inches, the last just 12 feet 6 inches. For Jimmy and me, it's a real question of putting our faith in technology, and so far it's not giving us any warnings. Are you nervous? No, not really. Do you trust the system? I'll let you know when I see things happening. <laughs> <laughs> if the bridge ahead is too low for our load, the device should start bleeping and flashing. The closer we get to the bridge, the more frequently these warnings should come. But for the moment, all is quiet. So there's our first bridge ahead, Jimmy. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm looking at the system and there are no warning lights at all. What we don't know is that our load is only 12 feet 3 inches. This bridge has the clearance of 15 feet 9 inches. In fact, every bridge on the course will easily let us through. I am quite nervous. What's that? 15, 15 foot, 15 nine, foot inches, 9 inches, 4.8 metres. There was no thud. Well, we're safely through the first bridge. Bridge number two. <laughs> this is a lower bridge. 14 foot. Not 
nothing. 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 I think we're clear here. Okay. And now onto the third bridge. This one has a clearance of just 12 feet 6 inches. No problems on that round. Now to up the load and the stakes. This time, unbeknown to us, our lorry has one of the highest loads you'll see on the road. It is 16 feet 6 inches and will not pass through any of the bridges. Can you hear that then? Yeah, I think it's picking up a bridge, isn't it? I think so. It's bleeping and it's flashing. These bleeps and flashes are warning us that we're less than one kilometre from our first bridge on a course that's too low for our load to pass through. As we close to within 500 metres of the bridge, the warnings increase. It doesn't like it. No, I'm not going to do it. No. no, no, no. Jimmy breaks and stops a safe distance away. But just to double check the system was right, he then edges up slowly. And there's no doubt we wouldn't have got through. Now for the acid test a medium-sized load which will pass through the first two bridges, but not the third. We're going to get under the first one by the look of it, yeah? No problems with number one. Here comes number two. I still have that horrible feeling just in case it doesn't work. We cleared it? Yeah, absolutely. But what about the third? It's sleeping, it's sleeping. No, can't do it. The test is a success, but what does Jimmy make of the kit? If one of these had been fitted in a cab, I think people who have been involved in low bridge collisions and got killed would, wouldn't have happened. It definitely wouldn't have happened. No, no way. And what about bus crash victims Ryan and Graham? I'm all for it because I wouldn't like anybody else to be in the same position with like a similar scar or anything. Now, although Jimmy would have one fitted to his lorry tomorrow, the £240 price tag might put a lot of people off. So it might take legislation before we can expect the device to be fitted to every lorry and bus in the country. Diabetes affects over one and a half million people in Britain and it's rising. If you get type 1 diabetes, you're in for a daily regime of blood tests and insulin injections and the prospect of long-term complications. Now, the holy grail of diabetes research is to get the body to produce its own insulin. Anya Sitaram meets the doctors in Australia who think they're halfway there. When Alexandra found out she had diabetes five years ago, she didn't just face a lifetime of endless injections, but a strict daily routine. So is it, is it difficult to remember all the time to, to eat the right things and to inject yourself at the right time? It must be quite difficult to remember all that. Yeah, well, my mum in the morning says, oh, have you had your insulin before I go to school? Uh -huh. And, like, she sort of, she's, or oh, like, she always says when I wake up, um, do your blood now? But I, I would always remember. Because her pancreas doesn't work, Alexandra needs to inject insulin to control her blood sugar, the body's source of fuel. Four times a day, she tests her blood for sugar levels and works out how much insulin she needs. She knows a lot about her condition, but when she was first diagnosed at seven, it was her mother who understood the full implications. She didn't realise what it meant, you know, because she said to me in the hospital that, um, well, don't, don't worry, Mum, I just have these needles. And this week, and then when I get out, I don't need to have them anymore. And I mean, I had to tell her that 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 wasn't right and that she's, you know, I knew for the rest of her life. No matter how well Alexandra controls her diabetes, both now and in the future, her sugar levels will inevitably seesaw up and down. These fluctuations in her blood sugar mean she's at risk of having serious long-term problems like blindness and kidney failure. But now research at the University of Technology in Sydney could reduce that risk significantly. Inside here is something which could mean the end of injections and prevent the life-threatening complications of diabetes. These are genetically modified liver cells. They've been altered so they can produce insulin, something which is normally only done by the pancreas. 
The beta cells in the pancreas are responsible for producing insulin, but in a person with type 1 diabetes, those cells have been destroyed by the body's own immune system. In the past, attempts have been made to restart the pancreas, but they've been unsuccessful. So a new organ, the liver, has been recruited by scientists in Sydney. These flasks could contain the holy grail for people with diabetes. Inside them are genetically modified liver cells that actually produce insulin. The liver has many functions, like cleaning the blood, but in Sydney, they're aiming to add to these and turn it into a replacement pancreas. The team, headed by Anne Simpson, have worked for six years to isolate the insulin gene and insert it into the liver cells grown in the lab. They hope that one day they'll be transplanted into the liver of someone with diabetes and then take the place of a healthy pancreas. These electron microscope pictures show something that has never been seen before. Granules of insulin inside liver cells. And that's what's really exciting about the adapted liver cells. They don't just produce insulin, they store it as well. So they're able to release the right amount of insulin at the right time. If you can make your own body regulate glucose, then you don't have to artificially inject insulin giving you a much steadier supply, which could hopefully prevent the long-term consequences of diabetes. Insulin is very important because it regulates the glucose metabolism. And the glucose metabolism is the most you know, important thing that keeps your body going. So if you're getting inaccuracies, if you like, it upsets, in simple terms, the organs and causes different parts of them to degenerate. The next step is to get the system up and running so people like Alexandra can live a healthier, longer life. The scientists hope that within five to ten years, these adapted liver cells will be transplanted into the livers of people like Alexandra, so she would be able to produce insulin all on her own. It's certainly a major step forward in the fight against diabetes, but it is genetic research, and this is a whole area of medicine that people find highly controversial. We're constantly hearing about new developments in this field, of which the most contentious are human cloning and designer babies, and it can feel like we've got no say in the matter. So, how far do you think it should go? Where should we draw the line? We want to find out what you think, and so we're running a straw poll on our website. If you log on after the programme, www.bbc.co.uk slash TW, you'll find the TW Genetic Survey. Here it is. What you do is click proceed and you'll get a medical scenario involving the use of genetic research. The first scenario is a mirror of what we've just seen in the film. Modification of liver cells to produce insulin. And as you go through the survey, the questions get more contentious. There are six scenarios in all. And each time you answer the question, should science be offering this treatment? They build up to a final choice. Would you like to be able to choose your unborn baby's genetic makeup? The questions will be available throughout the next fortnight, but we'll tell you how the results are going on next week's show. Remember, this is your chance to have your say about the future. Still to come, into the flames, fighting fires with the Navy in the latest training facility. And the newest executive gadget, the electrified briefcase that could give thieves a shock. Now... This is the amazing moment when the Mir space station burnt up on re-entry just over a week ago. It was the end of an era. The world's first long-term outpost in space finally disintegrating on its return to Earth. But it doesn't mean the end of human habitation in space. Mir's fiery end overshadowed another landmark in the construction and occupation of our International Space Station. Liftoff of Discovery and a team of explorers shaping their destiny. On March the 8th, three new pioneering astronauts blasted off the Earth to become the second crew to live on board the station, maintaining a permanent human presence in space and continuing the construction of our new outpost. The eventual 460-tonne structure will provide as much space as a Boeing 747 passenger cabin, where up to seven crew can conduct experiments in six laboratories. Over 30 more scheduled flights are needed to deliver the rest of the station to orbit. And life on this extraterrestrial construction site is still an immense challenge. All this assembly work is going on at over 27,000 kilometres an hour.
plunge into darkness every 45 minutes, astronaut Jim Voss wrestles to release one component to make room for another. During this, the longest spacewalk in history, a tool goes spinning off. And that's bad news when you're in space, because anything you drop could crash into you in a later orbit, with disastrous consequences. The only thing to do is move the whole building site, and so Commander James Weatherby fires up the shuttle's thrusters, pushing the whole space station into a safer orbit, four kilometers away from the stray tool. Why the day's work for these 21st century pioneers of space colonization? Well, joining me in the studio to discuss the state of the International Space Station is the editor of Jane's Space Directory and former NASA engineer, Dr. David Baker. Now, David, how good are the prospects for the International Space Station? Well, they're not good, Peter, and there are deep, serious concerns. If the Americans reduce the power levels by half by not completing their commitment to build the electrical source, then scientists will only have half the power they expected to do their experiments, and most of those need a lot of electrical power. Secondly, if they don't build the habitation module, then that's going to seriously reduce the potential for both working 24 hours a day and accommodating crew in rescue situations, for instance. And the third component of this is the fact that if the Americans don't build the rescue vehicle, then the crew will have to be half-sized, down to three, in order for the Russian Soyuz vehicle to act as a lifeboat. Goodness me, so without this huge American commitment, is the whole project virtually pointless then? doesn't make it pointless, Peter, but it gets us back into the problems we had with Mia, where there were too few crew members for the work that had to be done. So 80% of their time was spent doing housekeeping jobs and not proper science. OK, now, if the Americans aren't fully behind it, what about the Russians, the Europeans and others? Can, can we do it without their help, or more or less without their help? It's possible over time. Europe is already building manned laboratories for space station. It has a rocket system which is already launching half the world's commercial traffic and it has a capability for putting up modules the size of the Mir modules that the Russians launched. Oh well, those things aren't all that pessimistic after all. David Baker, thank you very much. And you can find out what the first crew of the space station had to say about their mission by looking at the Tomorrow's World website. Now, a life on the ocean wave in the Royal Navy is a life of self-sufficiency. You can't nip to the shops or go out for a change of scene if you're on board a ship. Likewise, in an emergency, if there's a fire, for example, there's nowhere to run. You have to face the problem and deal with it quickly, which is why realistic training is vital. Rajesh Merchandani assesses the latest fire training ship. It's one of the greatest dangers on board a ship, fire, as Warrant Officer Nick Aldridge knows only too well. Fire on board a ship means that you've got nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, you've got to do something about it, otherwise you're going to lose the ship and possibly life. But this is exactly what Nick faced on board HMS Illustrious on the 3rd of April 1986, when, just after midnight, the gearbox exploded, turning the machinery room into a fireball four storeys high. When the alarm sounded, initially I, I felt uh, a sense of, of panic. A fire in the machinery compartment is one of the worst places on board a ship to have a fire because of the sheer size of it. When we first entered the machinery room, the initial shock from the, the heat, uh, the thick acrid smoke that hit us, uh, we knew that we were heading into something pretty horrific. He didn't realize it at the time, but he was about to be caught up in the biggest ship fire ever to hit the Navy during peacetime. Nick and his team battled for nearly three hours before they finally got the flames under control. I always think uh, and cast my mind back on that day how lucky we actually were. Countless lives have been lost to fires at sea and it's a threat the Navy takes extremely seriously. That's why it's trying out a revolutionary new training system. What this is, is the latest technology that the Navy is using to prepare its new recruits for the work. It's the largest high-tech facility in the UK for fighting ship fires, and the company that runs it has just opened it for use. So it's the perfect opportunity to put the unit through its paces. With the help of Nick Aldridge and a little bit of training, I'm going to step into one of its fires. Ignition. Nick, let's go for it. It's dark and cramped. I feel claustrophobic, almost trapped, just like I'm on a ship. All I have to do is keep the hose steady and aim it above the flames, but with almost three litres of water pumping out every second, it's got a life of its own. For a brief moment, I lose my grip. 
suddenly the gas fueling the fire is turned up and pink propane flames shoot out. It's a real battle to put the flames out, but five minutes later, I've done it. <laughs> that was quite scary. I could just feel myself getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and I was thinking, what now? How did I do? Very well, very well. For the first time, very well. It certainly passed the reality test. In fact, if anything, it felt far too real, and that's exactly what this system has been designed to make you feel. This is the control hub. With a click of a mouse, this computer can get fires going in all the rooms on board the ship. It can recreate different types of fire, from waste bins burning to bunk beds going up in flames, right up to a raging inferno in the machinery room. The Navy used to train their recruits by igniting diesel underneath piles of wood. By contrast, this system uses gas pumped through these pipes. The computer operator can separately add smoke from oil burning inside these grey boxes. The idea is that because the teachers have complete control over the flames and the smoke, the students can be trained more thoroughly and more quickly. That's the theory. Let's see whether it works in practice. Now we're going to put this new fire training unit to the ultimate test. These Navy recruits have had about one day's training. They're about to face what could be the worst type of fire on board a ship. That's a fire in the machinery room. It's going to be a lot like the fiery inferno Nick encountered on board HMS Illustrious. So who better than him to lead this group of students? What are the kind of dangers of this type of fire? Extremely hot metal inside. Uh, it's going to be dense, a thick smoke in there, so the visibility is going to be nil. The only way into the machinery room is through this hatch. By spraying water from above, they prevent the flames from escaping and protect the firemen as they go in. The first thing the students do when they get down there is create a wall of water. This shields them from the heat, which can reach up to 300 Celsius. When everyone's in place, they shoot a jet of watery foam directly above the flames. Within 30 seconds, it's out. The whole exercise has taken 10 uncomfortable minutes, but that's no time at all when what they've learnt could one day save their lives. How much better is this system, do you think, than um, the old way? Well, it's far better because we can control it. If something isn't going right, we can stop it and restart the exercise from that point. So the training is absolutely superb. So if they'd been in your shoes on HMS Illustrious all those years ago, how would they have coped then? I think today they'd have won the day, definitely. The challenge in the future is to train up civilian operators like ferry companies to use this system, making it safer for the rest of us to go to sea. Well, the training ship is already in use and the company that runs it aims to train 10,000 Navy crew this year alone. Now, when it comes to cutting-edge technology for the whiz kids of today, there's really only one place to find the latest in hot gadgets, Japan. <laughs> I'm in Shibuya in downtown Tokyo on a busy weekday and I'm off to meet Ikuzo Fujimura who's going to be my guide to Tokyo for the day. He's going to help us test out some of the things that tomorrow's technology has to offer those who want to get ahead. Ikuzo runs a number of companies on the web and relies on the latest technology to keep his businesses up to date. Daily commuting is part of his everyday life. But in the rush to get the day's business done, it's easy to leave something crucial behind. If you're a forgetful fellow like me and you're worried about losing your computer on a train, for example, you slip this little card in like that, and this card is in touch with this bleeper here. So I'm going to put the computer down here and we'll see what happens, OK? Once slotted inside, the card transmits a radio signal to the receiver worn by the owner. Now, as soon as this beeper gets out of touch with that card, it'll start to beep. The beeping warns the owner that they've become separated from their laptop. That's a good idea, because you know, I forget things so easily. OK, and how many marks out of 10 would you give that? I give eight. 
During the daily rush hour, there's often more to be wary of than simply your own absent-mindedness. Crime rates are increasing in the city. Keeping alert for the thieves is crucial at all times. This is an electric briefcase yep. that emits a static charge of electricity when stolen by a thief. So off you go, and I'm going to try and snatch it from you and see what happens. The briefcase contains a static electricity generator and a radio wave receiver. The owner carries a radio wave transmitter separately. The transmitter and receiver stay in constant communication with each other. When this line of communication is broken, the briefcase's security system is activated. At a distance of five or ten meters away, communication between the owner's transmitter and the briefcase is cut. And this sends a preset message coming out of the case. You can hear the alarm ringing now. And that's not all. If a thief remains undeterred and continues to make off with the case, another level of security is activated. Static electric shock. A very small current, but of a very high voltage, 50,000 volts, goes through your arm and goes on going through your arm until you drop it and run away. I find it interesting, but you know, not for me. Because, Why not? Because you know, this thing is too big. How many marks out of 10? Uh, I give it five. After rushing around all day, it's a drag to come home and sit down at a computer desk again. You can now get the information you need in a much neater way than clicking with a mouse. With this new computer screen, you can download music from the web, watch movies or pictures from a webcam. You can even write messages and email them to your friends. Here we are lounging around in our sitting room, Ikuso, and if we want some music, just pick up a tile and pop it on the computer screen. Right. What about tomorrow's weather? Want to check on the weather tomorrow? Sure. Okay, well, right. well, let's get the weather tile. Here we are. There's the weather tile. And this little tag in the bottom mm. left-hand corner mm. is the thing that tells the computer what tile I've put on it. So I pop it on any of these squares here, over here, and there's tomorrow's weather. When a tile is placed on the tabletop, sensors identify it by the frequency it emits. Each tile has a different frequency and issues a particular instruction to the computer. I'm just going to send a, an email to Philip, if that's all right. This tile stores a range of email addresses that can be easily accessed. There she is. Love from Japan. And the touch of the pen sends my written message over the web. How many marks out of 10? 9.9. 9.9? Yes. You do like it. Yeah, Terrific. Yeah. But which device does Ikuzo think is best suited to busy Tokyo life? The best one will be that new computer system on the table because that was sensational. I never seen that kind of things in my life and that's so cool. All of the gadgets are still in the prototype stage at the moment but the forgetfulness alarm should be available in the autumn. That's all from tomorrow's world. Next on BBC One is Animal Hospital. See you next time. Bye. Goodbye. On tomorrow's world next time, finding buried bombs before they explode. The radical new implant to help people with depression. And the spy plane that fits in your pocket.